Welcome to Stone Club Walks and Talks, episode 5. Today we will meet with John Abel, the visionary artist and printmaker, to talk about the landscape and mountains of Wales, their ancient sites, also about his printmaking and his fine art. And of course, because it's John Abel, we're going to talk about some radical thinkers and different ways of looking at the world. We'll also be taking a trip around the Antrim coast with Fergal Lynn. On our visit to Cushendall recently, Fergal was one of the people we met and enjoyed spending a lot of time with, and he told us some of the folklore, legends and myths of the Antrim coast. So these are just a few snippets of conversation and some of the things he told us about as we uh, took the coastal road from Cushendall. So let's begin with one of Fergal's stories. Uh, This one really concerns a namesake of mine, perhaps even a distant relative. I'm sort of hoping not, because it's a grisly tale, but let's walk up the stairs to the tower and find out what went on. Okay, we're standing here in the ghost room of Ballygally Castle, the castle built by the Shaw family in 1600, it was built in 1625. His wife Isabella, gave birth to a baby girl here in Ballygally. Shaw, however, was livid. He was desperate for a male heir to ensure the castle would stay within the family. So he incarcerated Isabella Shaw in this very room, the turret, and she was left there to starve. Her screams echoed throughout the castle, but no one came to help. Eventually, in a desperate attempt to see her beloved daughter one more time, Lady Isabella clambered from the tiny window you see behind me in this room and fell to her death below. Sorry to be the doom and gloom, Uh, (laughs) Matthew, but I just thought let's go and visit the family seat of the Sean family. It's time to join John Abel. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, John Abel to Stone Club Walks and Talks. Um, John's become a real fellow traveller of Stone Club since we first met um, last year in Wales. And there are so many overlapping and connecting areas of interest. And I thought we have to get we have to get John to come and join us um, as soon as we can. So I'm delighted to say that John's here today. So welcome, John. Shalom, Matt. How's it going? Very good. Yeah, very good. We're both here in sort of very cold temperatures, but you're uh, you're in Wales and we're here in Cornwall. But I think we've got similar conditions, judging by the winter wear that we're both sporting. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably it's probably colder in my house than it is outside, and it ain't warm outside. <laughs> no, no, exactly. And actually, you know a thing about being outside because as much as we'll talk about art, being outside uh, in the mountains, particularly in, in extreme conditions, is obviously such a love of yours. You know, I think if you weren't painting, would you just be in the mountains the whole time, John? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like painting is the only thing that stops me from um, from. Uh, basically, yeah, never. never from, from, it's the only thing that gets me to come back down. But also, painting, yeah, painting is the only thing that stops me from always being in the mountains. You know, or, like it's, it, they're beautiful in the summer, but I think it's very important in the winter, especially because you know it's quite easy to kind of think of the winter as a very dark and gloomy time. But if you head up to the mountains at like seven a.m., yeah, and there till the sun comes down you know five six o'clock with a headlamp on you know the winter doesn't feel so um so dark and gloomy anymore you know and 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 where you live you can see the mountain ranges you've you've described them to me even when we were in liverpool together you were showing me the mountain ranges and telling me all the names so can you describe where you are and where you live and what's what's around you just so that people can get a bit of an idea about you know where you are well, so I'm I'm from like I spent my kind of childhood half in Cardiff and half in the Banat Bukhanyag, and um, now I live in um, 
the Cumbervoy, the Cymru, the South Wales Valleys. So, you know, I kind of, I kind of live in a, a very hilly, semi-mountainous area. And just north is the Banai Brickhanyag, um, which, you know, has some pretty, pretty beautiful, it has an amazing topography. And obviously, you know, further north, even, even Stellis, Amuri. And uh, so, um, all, all, all of Wales is knobbly, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and is that, you know, for you growing up between those places and, and, and where you're based now as well, was this, is this something that's a very early memory and connection for you? Was your connection with the mountains something that happened when you were very young, or is it something that's developed more over time, would you say? Well, when I was a kid, my, my grandmother, she lived in a village called Clanbiang or Talaklin, which is just by Clangor. So I used to go and walk up to um, Clangor's Lake, but behind there is a little mountain called Money Clangors. And I remember, you know, kind of being about 12 or 13 and going all the way up to the top of that. And then from there, you can look behind and there's an even bigger mountain called Money Troid. And I was like, well, I'm going to go up there. And from Money of Troid, you can look south and you can see kind of Penavan. And then I was like, well, I want to go up there now. And, you know, I started doing that when I was, when I was a kid. Yeah. But then obviously I kind of moved to England and, um, you know, bimbled around Somerset, London and places like that. But it's like when I came, when I came back to Wales, particularly when I, I moved out of, um, Cardiff, like the city I'm from. Yeah. I was like, if you're not going to live in a city in Wales, you have to embrace the landscape. You have to embrace the kind of topography of Wales. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, that journeying and, and reconnection, I mean, that's really interesting. I remember you, you talking about how you spent time on, on tall ships. You, you know, you, you've, you've traveled and sailed and done all kinds of traveling. Is the, is the traveling bug? uh you know something that caught you early and uh, is it something that's there still do you think the sort of the adventurer in you well it was a, it was a kind of weird thing so i've all i've always been like kind of very poor and i'd always be like you know kind of either precariously housed or homeless yeah and you know it just meant that i could pack up and leave and do things all the time so <laughs> so it's like you know, like uh, I remember, kind of, like I I spent kind of months in Somerset at a time, and like I'd work in between festivals and things, and then if I got offered a place on a ship, I'd just take a place on a ship. You got to see a lot of the world then through this sort of adventuring and going out to sea. You you became yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, lo a lot of um, the west coast of um, of Europe. Yeah, I was thinking a lot then about. Um, your 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 love of mountains and how we know that there's so many ancient settlements on the cairns and the uh you know on the top of the mountains and there's there's all kinds of footprints of of stones and our ancient ancestors and communities but i was also thinking then when you mentioned about the the seafaring about how you know that's another really ancient connection we've got with our with our prehistoric past you know this way of circumnavigating the globe and 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 finding our way to new communities and spreading information and meeting uh, people for the first time that that had other knowledges to share it, it's interesting that you followed a very similar path in that you connected very uh, very early and very profoundly with your local landscape and and yet this voyaging uh, was necessary before you were ena enabled to return you know something drew you back but you had to go away first well in, in welsh we call that you know that there's a word for that it's called Knevin. um and it, it's a kind of it's a kind of a deep belonging yeah it's quite profound belonging it's like you know a place that cradles you and for me i don't know what it is but i can never leave wales for long you know yeah is where home is yeah it always it always calls me back and and then it's like i think there's something i i can only speak for myself personally but there's something about really knowing a place mm. you know where where you know you were born in it your parents were born in it and you know you you kind of you want to know every nook and cranny of it and then the more you kind of discover the more there is to learn yeah 
including, I mean, in Wales, linguistically, you know. Yeah, and, and, and that's something else that's really important to you, I know, isn't it? The, the connection with not only the ancestry and the immediate generations of family, but also the connections right the way back through um, identity of culture, identity of not necessarily nationality, but nationality is a sort of a modern manifestation of that, but people, you know, your people. It's obviously very important to you, and I, I can see through your work um, that particularly, I mean, there's two aspects to that. There's the very visionary large scale oils and, you know, these incredible pieces that almost suck you in. They're like portals to other dimensions, dimensions in your mind and heart, I think, but they're there. And then there's this this other work that you've been doing that I'd love for you to tell us more about, which is... Um, it, in a way much more direct it's it, it's more inexpensive so that people with any sort of depth of pockets can you know also afford to um purchase your work or to have some in their own home but there's a direct connection there with a very radical um way of thinking being doing acting experience in life uh, and that seems to be something that's coming through very very strongly in your work currently so i'd love for you to tell us more about the, those sort of current obsessions and this printmaking um projects that you started towards the end of last year that just seems to be you seem to be just flooding with ideas for this all the time so then there's like <laughs> There's aspects, so, you know, kind of different things within art, you know, like painting is a very rarefied thing. You know, you make a painting and it's the only one. And in the, the way the kind of art market works, they become very rarefied. And if you're quite successful, they become very expensive. And there's something politically especially this society like ours, that it values possession, like its whole legal system is based on possession, right? There's something about making things that are so rarefied that can only be possessed by such a small amount of people that politically um, bothered me. And, like, there's something about printmaking and, and the radical history of printmaking you know, in, in every continent in which they've been made, they've been radical, that, that attracted me. Uh, and I thought that in the times we're in now, they're a very good medium to disseminate, you know, literary ideas, but also political ideas uh, in a visual form. So, like, my paintings... You know, some are quite visionary, some are quite medieval. I'm interested in expressionism and abstract expressionism, but it's like, it's, it's more of an intellectual thing, whereas printmaking for me is more of a populist thing and a literary thing. Yeah, and there's two things that I've really loved in seeing the work come through. One is some of the people you're choosing to celebrate. You know, you're, you're choosing so, some people that, they might be very well known in certain circles, but they, they could be tomorrow's folk hero for somebody else, you know, that's like, who is this person? I need to know more about them. They seem like a really interesting person. So they're jumping off points. You're creating an opportunity, you know, to enter worlds. And then the other side of the prints that I see you're doing that I really love is you taking these very ancient uh, symbols and these very ancient archetypes um whether or not you're using um you know statues that are thousands of years old that are found in europe or whether you're using you know a sort of green man or a sheila and a gig or you know some of these other ancient um a ancient symbols or certainly very very old symbols and and then you're twisting it because you're you're also given as a slogan or something to think about uh, on on top. So there's these different layers of meaning. So where where did that come from? That impulse, you know, it's kind of a mixture of medieval sculptor Romanesque ideas and you know all sorts of things colliding. So what what caused that to happen? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I wish I could um, give you a logical explanation, but the thing is, like, I've got a belief that if you have an idea. And yeah. it's a little bit outrageous and you say it out loud and you're like, that is a bit crazy. So I, th I think I was kind of thinking about Sheila and the gigs. And then I was thinking about the idea of, you know, 
you know, she kind of opening up a vulva, and then I was thinking about self actualization. Yeah. And then I thought, well, what about self actualization, Sheila? <laughs> and I was like, that idea is so daft and so like ridiculous. I just got to make it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and like I'm a big believer in that because, like, if you think something is absurd then go for it because in the making it'll be a lot less silly than the idea you know when, when it actually comes out and you, you turn it into a physical object you know it, it becomes kind of set in stone you know and and, and it, it becomes something that's you know quite bizarre and quite exciting yeah so when, when 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 sheila came out yeah. sheila she amused me then i was thinking well you know kind of who who's who would go well with Sheila? And then obviously I thought the Venus of Willendorf. Yeah. And I said, well, what would the Venus of Willendorf say? And it's like, well, obviously she's kind of a Marxist theorist. She she wants kind of everyone to be to be happy and she wants an egalitarian world. <laughs> and, then, and, then it went, and then it went from there. It's like, what does the Cernabash giant say? You know, he's got some ideas he wants to share with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so the series began and it's evolving and I, I love the way as well in which there'll be a slogan and then that'll change over time, uh, you know, and then there'll be a new iteration. So there's this sort of evolving um, aspect to it as well. The, the symbols are there, but they've got more than one message. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think they can say, they can say more than one thing. It's like, you, you know, you, you can make kind of really detailed, really beautiful and, um, ornate lino cuts and sometimes you know when you're working with a medium you just kind of you want to make something that's so graphic and so kind of direct but can take in kind of disparate interests it's like you know if you're interested in heritage you're interested in the history of art yeah but you're also interested in radical politics yeah you know it's how how can you bring them together and sometimes the best way is to do it as uncertainly as possible yeah and, and when when did your i mean i i guess this has been with you for a long time but where did your radical politics come from it, you know is is it something that's in the family is it something that you developed yourself because it's very strong but you're also very clear uh, and i'm always really impressed by the way in which you can very clearly um describe and um and explain um why it is you think these ideas are important and why some of these characters need to be remembered and possibly even revered and celebrated um so is this something you're constantly researching and questing for yourself in your own life uh, but did it begin in in childhood did it begin with family influence well i think not really i mean i i had quite, I've, I've, i had quite a difficult life and upbringing in ways and that you know i kind of got kicked out of school when i was 14 and i was i was street homeless yeah as a, as a teenager and then you know for a decade on and off i had like kind of really bad drug and alcohol addictions and periods of homelessness and things like that obviously it's all kind of sorted out now but i've been at, you know if you've been at the kind of lowest rung of society I think that automatically predisposes you to left wing ideas. And because I had kind of no formal education, no one telling me what to do, you know, the things that I got interested in, I got kind of interested in, in my own volition. And they're not necessarily things that, you know, kind of society, the education system would ne necessarily want you to be interested in. So it's like if you kind of if you if you become very left wing and you become interested in radicalism, obviously you want to look into the history of these things and see how far back they go. So you know, I, I personally think there's a lot in common with a thinker like Karl Marx as there is with you know a, a medieval priest like John Ball. You know, yeah, and 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 those comparisons I think are what I always find really interesting when you know you'll send me a message and you'll say read about this guy it, it needs yeah. <laughs> you know we were chatting about um the legalization of cremation i think the last time we did we did something together and we were thinking about 
well, you know, where do these things come from? Where do these ideas get discussed? Who is it that has to um, break boundaries in order to be able to move things on and progress things? And there seems to be a real interest um, that you have in people that have to sort of break things and have to push themselves to real extremes in order to be able to change the status quo and to, uh, you know, create a more utopian future or at least aim towards something that's more in line with their their worldview or or, or or towards what their worldview perhaps wants to be? Well, that was um, the, the chap who introduced cremation into the British Isles is a, is a local hero of mine. And he's a guy called Dr. William Price. Um, he was born just around the corner from me here in, uh, in Rudgery. And, you know, the, the guy, his radical credentials couldn't go that much could, couldn't get any more radical really he was a chartist he um was a guy who armed the chartist so he provided guns um artillery pieces you know he was, he was a proper revolutionary mm. and then he had to go into exile in france and he was a beautiful welsh speaker and um he thought he could read a stone that told him that you know, he has to come back to Wales because, you know, he's he's going to free Wales from English rule. And then when he came back to Wales, he kind of, he started a proto-NHS. He, he just used to treat people for free. Um, as long as they didn't smoke. That was his one provision. <laughs> and he, um, you know, he set up a druidic college. He was a mystic. So he, he had a mixture of the practical you know, the, and and the kind of esoteric combined. But when his um, when his son, his son was called Yesi Christ, Jesus Christ, and um, he had Yesi Christ when I think he was eighty two um, years old, and he died. He died in childhood, and he took him up to the mountain in Tlantusan, and he um, he cremated him, and it caused it caused a massive stink. And I think the locals initially thought that he'd murdered the child so um he got put in prison you know people were were it caused caused a massive brouhaha but then when when he went to court and he knew that british law allows something unless it's expressly forbidden right and he said that there's nowhere in the law that says that you can't dispose of a dead body this way and he won the case and then because of that Promotion became legalized and then, you know, over time became a, a, a totally normalized way of um, disposing of, of human remains. But he came to that idea because of his interest in Indian mysticism and, and Indian cremation practices. Like that's where he got the idea from. Now, the, uh, again, uh, I'm reminded here of, you know, some of the sites that I know that you you visit often when you're out in the landscape and, and when you're climbing mountains. And I'm thinking about those urn burials and I'm thinking about the, those ancient sort of Bronze Age cremations in the various sites. Um, one of the first pieces of work that I saw by you that really completely blew me away was your map of of uh, of Inismon of, of Anglesey uh, where you've got the whole map there of of the island and you've got you know well-known prehistoric um monuments on there like Bryn Kethley D you've got you know all of the things that you would imagine uh, in terms of landscape markers um but there's a profound connection with the ancient uh, and the radical and the landscape and your your place within it and it's kind of I don't know, it's like map art, you know, it's this massive, large scale print, the, the version of it that I saw in the gallery. Um, and so it, it it was an interesting thing to see because it seemed for me to sum up so many of the aspects of your work. You know, here you were um, creating something that was a very practical thing in one way, a map, um, you know, and obviously something that you use all the time when you're out. So, um I'd love to know a bit more about that and where that idea came from and this creating large scale maps, but of your own making, because it's not, you know, this isn't an ordnance survey map and it isn't a tourist attraction, no. is it? it they, they're kind of, they're, I see them as forms of psychogeography. You know, I, I kind of, I have quite a good knowledge of the topography of way up because I, I like my passion is to go as high up as I can within Wales and look at it. 
you know and and if you do that you can be like okay so this place is here this place is here that's that that's that that's that but then if you actually go to those places as well you know you 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 get an attachment a love of them early christian churches like things that are really beautiful and of note and then it's nice to kind of put them all together and join the dots you know but make it but make it deeply personal which it can't fail to be if it's made by someone you know so they're your own personal connections your own personal psychogeography but within an area that you've you, you've experienced you live in and i i really think that's interesting as well they get into the highest place to be able to look down and you know and to have that vast expanse beneath and to be able to say yeah i can see this i can see the topography of the land i can see the geology of the land i can see the coastline i can i can sort of understand it as a visual map as well yeah i want to try and like if you show something so it's not like a kind of still static map but you can show something that happened historically in a place and then something else that happened like a hundred years later in the place next door and something else that happened like a thousand years later you know further north and just put them all together and like place them within a landscape like that interests me so it's not like you read in a history book, but you're kind of having a history of a place presented to. And 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 then alongside that, I saw some of the the larger, more surreal and mystical works as well. And they they made me think. Well, these are inhabitants. These are aspects. These are archetypes of uh, you know, like a zoom in on some of the aspects of the map. You know, these are creatures that I believe live there. Um, you know, or inhabit it, or or, or an energy in some way. So is is there a lot of sort of zooming in and out of both um your focus of attention but also perhaps your inner and outer worlds as well you know your outer world being you know very robustly prepared to climb mountains and to be prepared for minus 12 degrees you know at this time of year but at the same time your inward journey seems parallel uh, and the art seems to parallel both these things one's very much like here's a slogan here's a message here's something that's for you to think about and the other one is going really deeply somewhere else you know almost deeply psychedelic as well um in the way in which it works so is is that the way your life and and mind work is that the way your heart sort of um expresses these things yeah i i think that um within art and it's, it's like you know kind of being a human being you're not kind of feeling one thing or you want to do one thing all the time so you know there are times when i'm, I'm like i've really got the desire to paint and I've, re I've really got the desire to kind of you know paint a place that you, is recognizably a place you know sometimes i i want to kind of make a strange scene or kind of depict humans doing things and then other times you know i, I want to write a poem and i want to carve it into words and print it onto paper you know yeah. and then sometimes you know i want to write a book and engrave and engrave it you know in almost a type of blakian fashion you know yeah well i'd, I'd love to see you do that well that's finished that that's oh. just that's just gonna get that's just gonna get printed that'd be coming soon Okay, well, that's exciting. Is that coming this year sometime? Yeah, it'll be coming this year. That, that's, some, that's something that I've been making in my evenings in secret. <laughs> um, and, you, you know, it's done. So um, it's just going to get printed, you know. Well, I can't wait. So I, I'm thinking that um, before we end, I'd really love to know where your current obsessions are whether they're those people or ideas or uh, you know or things that are preoccupying you at the moment in terms of your inspiration uh you know i'm really i feel really fortunate that you know that that we met and you send me things you'll know, be like you know check this out have a look at this read about this person um and and not all of our listeners will have uh the opportunity uh, to have heard from you on those things so what's getting you fired up and what you know what what sort of things are there that you'd like people to be considering or or who are the people that you'd like people to investigate more at this moment in time what's what's driving you john oh man that's such an interesting question so obviously i've got like artistic interest and i've got kind of <laughs> interest in this world but at, at the minute i'm i'm getting interested in 
ideas that sounds quite mad to say out loud, but serious ways in which a society can manage to exist without money. I'm becoming a money abolitionist. I, I think that anything that's good or needs doing in the world, money is an excuse not to do it. And anything that's awful, anything terrible in the world, money is no object to block it. So if if you have something where, you know, Elon Musk has the most of it in the world, and as someone who does useful work, like a nurse or a carer has none, then something has gone really, really wrong. And if there's always money to, you know, drop a bomb to protect a shipping container in the Red Sea, there's not enough money to fund a hospital properly, well, I think we need to start looking at um, an alternative way in which, you know, in which to frame a society, but even in, in which, you know, what we aspire to as people, because I think one of the biggest reasons why people who are kind of they're younger than 40 have had a mega, mega resurgence in folklore and kind of been interested in, in the, the history of things is because to go out and have a zero hours contract and never be able to realistically own a house, you know, the capitalist dream, it's just not there. They yeah. just don't see it. And, and when that happens, you can't really aspire to anything within that. Then you start, then, then you become like magical and you're thinking again and you, you become re-enchanted. And I honestly think that the, the kind of resurgence in folklore is a reaction to that. There, yeah. There's, there's got to be more where you have religion declining, right? So you don't believe in that anymore. But you also don't believe in your kind of society. You think it's a bit corrupt. Then you get interested in magic. <laughs> I think a lot of the interest in folklore and a lot of the interest in prehistory uh, is driven by looking back, uh, you know, to have an understanding of where we are in order to inform our future, you know, to, in order to, to, to figure out where we're going. Um, and, I, and I think for me anyway, you know, increasingly over the years to be able to break out of redundant political systems and uh, to break out of um, confined ways of working, and to, to, to go back far enough so that we can avoid all of that to create something new is a really exciting opportunity. I think that like one of the most stark examples, I mean, aside from the, the, um, the, the barbaric things that happen in the world right now is, um, you know, how you can have mega scientific consensus, the climate change and the climate catastrophe and, and, you know, the kind of lifestyle that we have that, that is exacerbating that. How, you can have consensus that that is happening, but also you can't do anything about it because to do something about it would, by definition, disrupt the economic system, you know, that we have. It, it is, to me, it's quite maddening, you know? Yeah, and so searching out those alternatives and questing for those people that have clues from the past, uh, you know, is a really interesting way to go. But I, I also think that the work you're doing, it's offering both a, a beautifully artistic alternative view and a very, very clear, literal, radical one as well, you know, with the printmaking. So, you know, I, I, think, that, I think there is work going on there. there. There are people that are sharing things that are breaking outside of those confines of, um, as you say, the very difficult world that we're living in politically socio-politically geopolitically at the moment so you know I, I love what you do and and the reasons why you do it i think it's really important and you know all power to you in that john thanks matt i'd, I'd just like to add that all the people who aren't mad and think that it is terrible what's going on we all need to come together and change it 100 percent <laughs> Oh, thank you, John. It's my always a pleasure. Let's rejoin Fergal now on the Antrim coast. The caves, right? The caves yes. at Waterford. There's three caves there. One 
was a hedge school, so you know you've heard of hedge schools where the kids came, they were educated. And the other one was occupied by a, a lady called Nan Murray. And Nan Murray made her living by selling pouchy to passers-by. This is before the Coast Road, just yeah. the early, early days of the Coast Road. So she sold pouchy to passers-by. Then the customs came and started prosecuting her for selling pouchy. That's an old pair of them. used to ship iron ore. So they used to mine iron ore up in the mountains behind us, uh-huh. take it down on a single track railway to right to the end of that pier and then ships would export it to all over the place really. But anyway, Nan Murray was selling pouchy to her uh, customers. Customs came and stopped her and threatened her that you know you better stop that or you're gonna get jailed. Um, so she still made pouchy but sold them water and gave them the pouching free. Yeah. She was able to lip hold the lip hold the law. So and then when I was growing up there was a hearse and that one of those caves used to drive in I think it was like a garage and the, the local undertaker had a hearse in it and I mean the locals would tell you actually slept in it at night but I think that was just embellishing the mm. yeah embellishing mm. the, the undertaker story. And what would this have been like at the time? Would it be more like a trackway than sand a sand? Yeah, yeah, sand. And like the road that goes up to the hidden village, that yeah, kind of trackway. Much. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that was the old coast road. The, the, the road went up um, over the hidden village and through it, and then down the other. I saw in your photographs you saw the Disneyland cottage. Oh, we did. Yeah, yeah. It just ruins yeah, that. there yes it's called the white lady oh and it's called the white lady because it supposedly resembles a Did we passed this yesterday a, i was wondering about the lady with a with a flowing like yes like robe yeah. ball gown yes. type thing and they've sort of reinforced around the neck you could mm-hmm. see that yeah because they didn't want it toppling but that's known locally as the white lady and the legend is that once, if the white lady ever falls, the world is over. Yes. So the white lady goes down, we're all going down. Chapel, Catholic Chapel. Yeah. Legend had it in this parish, in this part of the Glens, that a church would never stand in the parish. Um, so there was a father for the Simons, was the priest at the time set about to build the church. And when he was building the church, a ship that was carrying in the slaves ran aground and got lost just off Garn Point here. So and all all on board were lost. So they lost the, 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 the slates. You know, so it was a pers- huge disaster. Huge disaster. So they persisted with building the church in a way, of which they did build and defied the legend that the church would never stand in the parish. Yeah. And um, so when Father Simon's died, his headstone blew over, which is a oh. uh, nice little sort yeah. of like up yours to the to the. Uh, oh, we should go to the pier because there's where the pot of gold is. Thanks for listening to Stone Club Walks and Talks. You can find us in all the usual places, Instagram, Twitter, and of course our website, stoneclub.rocks. And don't forget to like and share the podcast. We'll be back soon with another walk and another talk. Goodbye. Goodbye.